the traditional owners of the land on which each of us are meeting today. And for me, that is the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands and waters across Australia. I pay my respects to elders past and present and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, including members of the Stolen Generation. First, a little housekeeping. We're on Zoom. So at the conclusion of the talk, we're going to have opportunity for some Q&A. If you have any questions, you can submit them throughout the seminar using the chat function, which can be opened using the chat tab at the bottom of your screen. Today's seminar will be recorded and uploaded to our website within a couple of days. So do keep in mind that if you turn on your video to ask a question, that your image will be included in the recording. Today, we're very lucky. We're going to be hearing from Professor John Piggott. John is Director of the Australian Research Council Centre for Excellence in Population Aging Research, CEPA, at the University of New South Wales, where he is the Scientia Professor of Economics. A former Australian Professorial Fellow, he has published widely on issues in retirement and pension economics and finance, and in public finance more generally. He's undertaken consultancies and contract research for a range of foreign governments and international organizations, including Indonesia, the World Bank, and the Asia Development Bank and UNESCAP. And at the national level, he was a member of both the Henry Tax Review in 2009 and the Australian Ministerial Superannuation Advisory Committee for five years from 2007. Professor Piggott um, was appointed an Order of Australia in the 2020 Australia Day Honours List for his distinguished service to education, to population aging research, and to public finance policy and development. Today, he is going to be presenting on Australia's approach to social protection in the context of population aging. And uh, I use this opportunity to say, uh, welcome, John, and over to you. Thank you very much uh, for those kind words of introduction. Uh, it's a great opportunity to present on this topic um, to, this, to this audience. Uh, what I want to do today, it's not a typical research seminar. It's trying to give a kind of overview of the way Australia in particular approaches social protection. And I want to argue that the way we do it, which is not typical across developed countries, um, helps us a lot in an era where populations are aging. Uh, why isn't this working? Come on. There we are. Um, so I want to start with the broad picture of the underlying economy uh, and then turn to policy and then put those together to see what the fiscal impact is and then draw some conclusions at the end. And so I'm going to begin with um, demographics and uh, see, see where that takes us uh, and then turn to the economics after that. So this is a chart that many of you will be familiar with, the population pyramid and people getting less numerous as they age. And this is what Australia's pyramid looked like at Federation, but it changes, right? And gradually it becomes less of a pyramid. And then around about now we have the baby boomers, you can see them growing through there. And then more and more people get old, and so you get an expansion toward the top. And so that's what we think it might look like in 2051. And this is what Japan will look like in 2050. So you can see Japan goes from pyramid to coffin. We don't quite do that. We don't get quite so old as Japan, but we will be older than we currently are, and that will have implications for fiscal outlays, because quite a lot of fiscal outlays are directed toward older people in the population. So another way of measuring aging in the economy, and this once again takes us from federation through to 2050, is to just look at the median age. The median age gradually increases from federation. And then after the Second World War, there was the baby boom, and that meant there were a lot of young people, and so the median age declined. And it may have also declined a little because uh, people were killed in the war or died as a result of injuries after the war. 
But then from about 1970, when the reduction in fertility occurred, the so baby boom was kind of over, uh, median age started increasing again, and it's still increasing, as you can see, and we expect it to increase through to the middle of the century and beyond. Um, perhaps the most informed way, though, of thinking about uh, measuring population aging is to look at what's called the dependency ratio. Dependency ratio is the population aged more than 65 is a percentage of what we think of as the working age population, which is 15 to 64. That's a miss type at the top there. It's not 54, it's 64. And this is what Australia looks like. And you see it's gradually increasing, but not hugely dramatically. It is increasing though. This is what Japan and China look like. We look like the USA uh, amongst developed countries. And you can see a country like India. You can see Japan and China, it's, it's a very dramatic increase. And if you took some other countries in Asia, um, a topic that I'm very interested in at the moment, it's even more dramatic. Uh, and I'll get to that in, in a few minutes. But what's driving this is the reduction in fertility much more than the increase in longevity. And so that's something that you should bear in mind throughout this talk. Uh, so that's the dependency ratio. It's not a perfect measure uh, because old age dependency will vary with participation in work at later ages, for example, and that changes through time. Uh, but it's so universally used that it's very convenient, especially for international comparisons. So how are these things made up? Well, we'll start with longevity and I'll just show you a slide or two on longevity. This is what's been happening over the same period to longevity, life expectancy at birth for Australian males and Australian females. And I have there in gray as a comparison what happened in Japan. And you can see in Japan, people died quite early right up until the end of the Second World War. And then there was this sudden increase in um, life expectancy, and then it kind of asymptotes in, so it looks pretty much like us, and many developed countries look pretty much like us. Um, the US is a bit lower than some of the others. So that's life expectancy at birth. But what about midlife longevity? So what we've done here is just look at the percentage point reduction in mortality um, by age, and this is just for females now, but you get the similar picture for males, right? For two periods, one, the first half, roughly the first half of the 20th century, and then the second half of the 20th century, 1890 to 1950, 1950 to 2010. And so the red reductions are reductions which took place in that first period. And you can see they're very heavily concentrated in the first half of life, right? But when you look at the second set of statistics, the ones that look at the second half of the 20th century, a lot of that increase in longevity is happening at later life. And that, that's important in a way because it, it's, it took governments and it took individuals, it took individual households and families a little by surprise. People say, I'm gonna die when I'm 70 and they give till they're 85. Um, but they hadn't actually factored that into their lifetime decision making. And so now we're across it, but I don't think we were across it in the same way 30 years ago. Now, a second piece, of course, is fertility. And this is what's happened to fertility uh, in Australia. So um, gradually after Federation, fertility fell particularly fell through the period of the Great Depression there in the early 30s. And then after the Second World War, you get that hump, which we refer to as the baby boom. And then it came down again and it stayed pretty low. Now, the total fertility rate is the estimate of the average number of children a woman has in her reproductive life. Uh, and the number for population replacement is 2.1. To give you a sense of how sensitive this scale is, I call it the power of 1.4. If fertility fell to 
then cohort size would halve every two generations. Uh, and so that that's actually a pretty powerful population reduction mechanism. And that's exactly what's happening in countries like Japan now. We sit at around 1.6, but we have another huge advantage. And that advantage is migration. And I'll, I'll talk a little about migration. I'm not going to show you numbers, but I will talk a little about in due course. This is what Japan looks like, and you can see it's very much lower. But the projection period, which on this slide starts in 2011, shows an upward trend. That upward trend has not eventuated over the past decade. These numbers have stayed very low. Um, and you know we've heard all about how uh, China has a very low fertility rate, and we're trying to, you know, governments are trying to encourage it with pronatalist policies and so forth, which are largely ineffective. Um, so that that trend upwards is a kind of UN assumption, um, but it's not something that's actually being realized. So migration, I don't want to give you numbers because they're so volatile at the moment, but I'd make just two observations. The first is that our skilled migration program, the number of pieces to migration in Australia, but the skilled migration program um, is extremely important. And it brings young-ish people in to the country. And that can make up the difference between the 1.6 fertility rate that we observe and the 2.1. Uh, it doesn't quite. So that's why you get that gradual aging, but it does a lot of it. Um, and the second point I want to make is that our access to those skilled migrants depends a lot on our international education program. So another piece of migration is to have students come in from other countries around the world and undertake international, undertake education in Australia, higher education especially. And something like half of the permanent migrants that we that eventually settle here have had an educational experience in Australia previously, not necessarily immediately previously. They may have gone back to their home countries and come back again, but something like half have done that. So that international education program very much kind of fertilizes the school migration program that we have. And so it's very, they really work hand in hand um, to give us the kind of very benevolent overall migration program that we enjoy. It's just gone very volatile at the moment, principally because people aren't leaving the country or have not been, and it started now, have not been leaving in the country in the way that uh, was normal in the period prior to COVID. Okay, so that's population, and that's the first of what will end up being three Ps in this talk. And the second P is participation, by which we mean participation in the labor force. Let me talk just with a couple of slides about that. So this is once again women, and it shows how labor force participation has increased over the past half century or so uh, for women. And you can see Australia's increasing more rapidly than the OECD average. That probably has something to do with increases in the pension access age. There may be other reasons as well. Um, but that gradual increase in women aged 55 to 64 in the labor force uh, is largely informed by women's greater commitment to the workplace, which really began in the 60s and 70s and has followed through ever since. So women now, right, there's a much higher proportion of any given cohort of women in their 50s and 60s um, who are committed to the labor force. And as that increases, you get this increased mature labor force participation rate. Men look a little bit different. Uh, so if we go back to the 1960s and 1970s, you'll see this downwind trend in labor force participation. And really that occurs because in the early 70s, um, the, we experienced a kind of global recession, which was some people say associated with very dramatic oil price hikes. And so there was um, uh, difficulty in employing young people. In many countries around the world um, took the following policy. They, they said, well, what we need to do is provide early social security 
so that older people will leave the labor force and that will leave vacancies for younger people to join. Now, this is a fallacious economic argument. You know, the, the, the economy is not a, not a crate where you take one bottle out and put another in. It's a balloon that blows up and down. And uh, this, this particular argument actually has a name in economics it's called the lump of labor fallacy. And if policymakers and bureaucrats and politicians had properly understood that fallacy back in the 1970s, the world would have been a much better place. By the 1990s, they kind of cottoned on and access ages for social security were being increased again. And you can see that in many countries, that trend is once more up and the OECD average, the trend is up also. But it sort of illustrates the importance of well-informed policy frameworks in thinking about policy settings. And the third P is productivity. Now productivity, what productivity is, is for every hour worked, how much GDP is generated. That's what productivity is, labor, labor force productivity. And so it moves around a lot. The idea is that in the long run, uh, productivity growth should be positive because we have technology which makes labor more productive produce more things with better machines. Um, and the assumption in this chart is that the long run average is about one and a half percent. It's probably a bit less than that. It's probably about 1.2%, 1.3%. It's a lot lower than it was. In the 70s and 80s, where you have all that volatility, if you average all that out, it comes pretty close to 2%. But now it, it's a lot lower. And that means that overall wage growth is slower than it once was. And you've probably heard a lot about that in uh, the popular debate on the macro economy. So that's the third P, that's productivity. Now I'm gonna give you an equation and I'll take you through. And just to make it easy, I'm gonna start on the right-hand side. Okay, now the right-hand side is begins with population. So that's the population 15 years and over. And then participation, well, it's the labor force right, um, over the population of people able to join the labor force, but you've got to take account of unemployment, so the employment ratio, and you've also got to take um, account of how many hours people work, so the average hours work. So you put all those things together and you get uh, a meaningful figure for participation. And then productivity, as I've just said, is GDP over hours. So you can cancel those out. The POP15 pluses cancel and the LFs cancel and the EMPs cancel and the hours cancel and you end up with GDP. And you've heard these debates. We have debates about population and migration. We have debates about how we can get people to participate more in uh, the labor force. And you have endless debates about how we might increase productivity. And all of this really um, takes place because of the contribution of each of these P's to GDP. And in this context, that's extremely important because if we have strong GDP and strong GDP growth, we have a revenue base that can sustainably finance strong social protection programs. And that's one half of the story. The other half is how you might make the social protection programs themselves affordable. And that's what I'm going to be turning to Next. So policy context, I'm going to talk about pensions and I'm going to talk just a little bit about health and aged care, but mainly about pensions. So let me start there. But what I want to do first is talk about the difference between our approach to social protection and the approach that's adopted elsewhere in the OECD. So the way I try and distinguish this is to distinguish between needs and rights. If you talk to someone from Canada or the US or France about unemployment benefits, to take just to take us out of the context of population aging for a minute, what you'll find is that they will say, yes, we have a, a social security contribution that you must make when you're employed and you make it and that buys you insurance. And then if you become unemployed, um, the insurance will pay out until 
for some period, usually quite a substantial period, and then, of course, it runs out because you're only insured for so long, depending on the number of contributions you've made. And then you're on what's called welfare, which is a very low level of general um, non-contributory support. So I say, well, actually, we don't have insurance. We have benefits. And if you become unemployed, we'll pay you a benefit if you need it. But if you're married to someone or you live with someone, your partner has a good job and is employed and gets, gets a good income, we won't pay you. And they look at you like you're mad. They have no way of actually conceiving of a social protection program, which is based on needs rather than rights contingent on social security payments. And I think our approach, my, my, my thesis in some sense, is that our approach on needs is, is much better in the context of population aging. The rights approach works well when you have ever increasing populations. But when you confront declining working age shares of population, which is what many countries around the world confront and what we will confront in some degree, um, it's much more difficult to do the rights story. And that's particularly true, particularly true in the case of pensions. Mm -hmm. So that second point there for an aging nation, a needs-based system is much more manageable in terms of fiscal outlays because funds go where they have most social value. So what, what we have done, I don't know how systematically, I don't know how, you know, whether we began with this grand plan or whether we've just ended up here, but what we've done is, is adopted a universal system of support where usage is universal like healthcare, but otherwise we target. We say only if you need it. And that's exactly what we've done, of course, with the age pension. The other point I wanted to make before getting into pensions is that there's a lot of heterogeneity in what people need at later ages. So this three-way chart here looks, I, we use this a lot in the context of developing economies. So Think of a poor country, you rely on yourself and your family, and then the country gets a bit better in the community organizations, and then gradually the public sector takes over with uh, greater per capita income and, and rising rising living standards. Um, so that's that, that kind of vertical axis. And then the, the domains of need are, are retirement, healthcare, and long-term care or aged care. But the population, that horizontal piece and population courage you know, there are lots of different categories of people who enter this period of their lives. They could come from the informal sector in Australia, I guess, you know, the gig economy or the self-employed, or they could come from the formal sector or they belong to governments that tend to get better pensions, not so much in Australia, but in many countries. They could be poor, they could be rich, they could come from the country or the city, they could be women or men. And this means that it's quite difficult to design good policies that are fair because there's so much heterogeneity in the population that you're attempting to address. And I think that needs to be borne in mind in assessing and in considering the formulation of policies in this space. So the way we think about pensions, you've got to sort of systematize it. And this is retirement income kind of overall, I guess you would say. Uh, and I think you've got to think of the overall retirement system. Uh, we have three, what we call pillars, um, and they have different functions. So they're not pillars divided on where the money comes from. They're pillars divided on what their function is. And the first function is to provide a safety net, an adequate level of support uh, in retirement. And that could be everybody, or it could be targeted. In Australia, we've chosen targeted, you'll recall. And then that second pillar is not really about getting people out of poverty, although often there's a piece of it that does that. It's um, about income replacement or about consumption smoothing between working life and retirement life. And it could be that people make contributions in their working lives and those contributions are directly used to fund the currently retired, or it could be pre-funded. And that means the contributions you make are preserved and invested and fund your own retirement. And it could be in the public or the private sector. And then the third piece is voluntary saving for income replacement. And we have that in Australia, which you're aware, right? Uh, additional additional um, uh, contributions to superannuation, 
you have your principal residence, which is very tax preferred, and so forth. Now, if this was Germany, this is what it would look like. The, the means tested safety net would be very, very minimal. The main pension would be public provision, pay as you go. Right? And then there's a little bit of extra. And even housing is not particularly important in Germany. Right? There, there are many, many people, many more than in Australia, rent, have long-term rentals, long-term leases. They don't, they don't have the the asset backing that many Australians do. It's, it's done pretty much in the way that's described here. And that works well if in every generation you have more and more people, you have a fertility rate of 2.5, doesn't work so well when the fertility rate is 1.2. So by contrast, this is what Australia has. So we have this targeted age pension, we have a funded private pension, which we call the superannuation guarantee. And then we have various bits and pieces, including housing and tax concessions for additional voluntary superannuation contributions up to a limit. I think it's $27,000 a year. That would, that's what we have in our, in our pension system. Now, where does that place us? Well, first thing is that if you're thinking about the total assets of private pension schemes, we are very high. We're up there with three or four other countries that have actually broadly similar schemes, Switzerland, Iceland, and the Netherlands all have this pre-funded um, piece, uh, different in detail, but very similar in other ways. Um, so we're way over the right-hand side of this chart when you look at all the different countries, but we're way at the other end when it comes to total pension spending. And sometimes this chart is used against us and we're told that we're very mean, but actually, because we've targeted this pension and because we rely more heavily on pre-funding, it makes good retirement income policy much more affordable. So this is exactly what I mean, right? When I say needs rather than rights for the public side of things where you can organize that. So that's, that's what I think these charts illustrate. Okay, so health, well, Many in the audience here, I'm sure, will know more, much more about health funding than I, but I'll just point out that we have a public and a private system. It's been around, Whitlam first introduced it in the 1970s and then Fraser abolished it and then it came back for keeps um, under Hawke. Um, it's, a, it's a good system, I think uh, one of the better systems in the world for health and it's affordable to many people. It's becoming less affordable in some ways and that's some of the stresses that I've been referring to in the economy as a whole. Uh, the private side of things means that people get marginally better care, but they're, uh, they, they pay insurance for it. And when they pay insurance for it, that takes some of the financial stress off the public system. The tax levies don't pay for the whole story at all, but they do act as a bit of an incentive to go private if you can afford it. And there's fairly broad co coverage although uh, across your needs, although it's not as good as it could be, and there are increasing co-payments. So this gives you an idea of where health spending might go as a percentage of GDP. So back in 2014, it was about 10%, 7% public, 3% private. Now it would be maybe eight or nine percent public, um, and four or five percent private, but it's going to go up. Uh, there's no question uh, with population aging because a lot of health services go to people in the later part of their lives, and the system that we have keeps this within some kind of of bound. Right now, the U.S. has a demographic structure quite similar to ours. Uh, now, where the coloured piece there, right, about a third of the way across, um, and you can see that we've got about that that uh, that piece that's pink, that's the public, and the piece that's red, that's the private, and then the piece on top, that's the out-of-pocket. But compare that with the US, right, where it's already at 18 or 20 percent, and they're actually their life expectancy is a lot lower than ours. So... What we have is something that, that actually looks 
pretty okay by national standards and by Anglo-Saxon standards, I think looks looks very good. Um, now, aged care is still sort of up for grabs. So we do have an aged care system, but there's been, as you will all be aware, a lot of controversy around it. Um, and I don't want to go on a lot about it, but this is where we sit in terms of public and private expenditure. And because the amount that we are going to be spending on aged care, both home and institutional aged care, over the next period will proportionately increase quite dramatically. So at the moment it sits at around, I think, 1%. Um, it, it, it could easily double. Right? And that's not nothing in the context of the overall economy. So there are debates about how we should finance that. And what I would try to argue is that it would be better to do this consistently with the philosophy that I have tried to articulate that I think represents what Australia has done. So that what you have is a system which relies on, on a needs base. So you provide aged care services where they are needed, but if the client, for want of a better phrase, can afford it, they pay a proportion. So you would have deductibles, you would have co-payments and so forth associated with this, but you would not have a system where people were excluded because they had not paid a levy. Right? So that would be inconsistent with what we've done in other domains like, like um, pensions. So where does that leave us in terms of what it means for the FISC? Now, we've talked already about GDP, so that's the denominator in this. The numerator is pensions, health, and aged care. There may be others, but they're the big three. Um, and this is what we think will happen with health, up a lot, with aged care, up a lot. Now, pensions, this is an old chart. This was based on the intergenerational report of about 10 or 12 years ago. And you can see pensions are going up as a proportion of GDP, but the most recent um, intergenerational report reverses that. And the reason for that reversal is that we have tightened our means tests. Now, we did a lot of research in CPAR that showed those tighter means tests, those tighter tapers um, were beneficial in terms of the way the economy worked as a whole. But one consequence of that tightening is that as the means test, as, as superannuation increases in its value, because now people have not had a whole career at 12% of superannuation guaranteed contributions, when they do, the means tests will cut in, even properly indexed means tests will cut in and will actually reduce the commitment of the government, right, as a proportion of GDP to the age pension. That's remarkable in this day and age. That's very unusual. Once again, I think it's it's supportive of my thesis that this is the way to go in terms of in terms of designing. Um, a social protection system. If taxes stay as they are, right, um, we don't change taxes. So this is the other debate that you will hear at the moment. Taxes stay as they are, then this is what happens to the Australian government balance. You can see it goes south, for want of a better phrase. And that's why we have such active debate around taxation reform. We will need more taxes to maintain the quality of the social protection structures that we have, even though we have by and large designed them so that they are well targeted and are affordable. And that comes straight from the gradual change in demographic structure. So when we have that tax reform, what we want to do is change taxes in a way that does not discourage participation and that encourages productivity and that allows for population, young population growth. Make sure those three Ps support growth in GDP. So it all kind of fits together um, so that we can maintain sustainably what we have and hopefully improve it. So 
in conclusion, I think I would say this, that relative to many developed nations, we're in a good position fiscally, but to stay there and to cope with these increased pressures, we've got to maintain the three Ps, skilled migration, try to increase productivity and participation. I think we need to maintain a needs-based approach to social protection, and we need to increase taxes in a way in, consistent with those earlier points to maintain the quality of social protection. This is what economists like me worry about a lot. Uh, these are not easy issues to resolve, and they are the meat and potatoes of the policy debate to which you all have access at some level. I'm going to stop there, but thank you very much for the opportunity to talk, and I look forward to questions. Terrific. Thank you very much for that, John. I think that was a, a very good and helpful overview. Um, I've got several questions uh, and comments, but before I get into it, um, just like to open it up to the floor. Uh, if you have any questions and or comments, um, please feel free to either pop them in the chat um, and or just, uh, I guess, raise your virtual hand if you like, and um, and you're welcome to, to ask the question as well. Um, John, while that's going on, I might just get you to stop sharing your screen if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Thank you. I've already got a um, comment um, to which I could, could respond that technology rather than aging, uh, technology rather than aging uh, is the important driver of increases in healthcare costs. And that's true as far as it goes. But if you look at where the healthcare costs have, where, where the technology is directed, a lot of it's directed toward the older population. And uh, so it's kind of a, 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 a derived demand, if, if you like, that uh, because of the increased older population, a lot of medical technology innovation is directed toward that older population. Um, Leon, you made the comment, but you've got your hand up. Would you like to elaborate or add a bit more? Yeah, um, I guess the point is that it's only sick people that use healthcare and you don't use much healthcare when you're young. So part of the problem is that 50% 50, 50 of healthcare is directed at people over the age of 65, but that doesn't necessarily mean that because the aging of the population that healthcare costs go up much by themselves, that's the 20%. Most of the healthcare costs, 20% is due to the aging of the population, but the other 80% is because we're paying a lot more for drugs, we're paying a lot more for technology in hospitals, we're paying a lot more for machines. And the other thing that happens is there's, there's market failure in a lot of these areas where the profits are very large and the, technolo and the technological advances are very small. So we get, we're paying a lot for incremental increases in the quality of healthcare. Uh, and this is this seems to be worsening over time. So, well, so one of the issues there is that you know the biggest the biggest makers of profit in the world are arms and uh, drugs, and both illegal and legal. And so we pay a lot. We're paying a lot, and this is going to be extended into the future. Whether that's fair or not, that's a debatable question. Thanks, Leon. John. Um, I, I don't know enough about health to respond very meaningfully. I just, I just reiterate that quite a lot of those, quite a lot of the technological innovations, right? M maybe there's monopoly rents that, that get into this, but <coughs> quite a lot of the technological innovations are directed toward older people. So although it's not, the 20% doesn't capture that. 20% captures the increase in the older population as a proportion of the total population. But some of that increased, some of that 80%, a lot of that, a disproportionate amount of that 80% is directed toward innovation, which directly benefit the older population. All right, um, I might move us along. Uh, Kate has put a comment in the chat and has asked, does the cost of the National Disability Insurance Scheme have a big impact? 
and this is something, once again, I'm going to have to claim ignorance on. I think I really, I, I, I think my sense is that in this, the heart was in the right place, but the execution was not well attuned. And clearly it's a, it's a, a very important policy and clearly many of the people who benefit from it are, uh, we, should, we should try to help. I haven't included it here because it seems to me that the disability story is not an aging story. Uh, well, we probably. That, right? <laughs> Sorry, we, we probably <laughs> we, we we could debate where <clears throat> the disability and aging stories are are, <clears throat> are uh, the same or not. But I think certainly for many older well, people with a disability, um, it's it it is a separation that has left them worse off. Yes, I think that might be true. Um, now, we've got a, a very interesting question here from Jane, who says, what happens if Australian voters resist increased taxes? Well, I think there's always resistance to taxation increases. And I think it requires a lot of political skill to persuade an electorate that increases in taxes are to everyone's benefit or to many people's benefit. Um, but I think that can happen. I think it is possible to argue, it's possible for politicians to introduce such arguments. It doesn't all have to be done kind of by stealth through bracket creep. And for example, right, uh, Many governments over the past 50 years have thought a broad-based goods and services tax would be infeasible. But John Howard simply made it a, a kind of goal of his through a single term. It was about the only thing he did, but he did get it up, right? It was imperfect, but he got it up. And there aren't that many countries where that has occurred. Uh, and so that's an example of how, despite consumer resistance, um, it's possible to develop um, tax bases that are lucrative. It would be um, nice I... to think, for example, I think a resource rent tax would be a great idea, right? But that seems not to be happening for the moment. Um, I had a question. I was very struck throughout your presentation as you sort of juxtaposed needs versus rights in that in the kind of approach that has been taken. Um, and I was sort of thinking, you know, at the same time as you were showing those slides, we've got increased labor force participation of women, and you know, they at the same time. Um, there's this tremendous income inequality and older women being left behind in many respects uh, in terms of their financial security. Um, it it just struck me there that, that that was one thing that kind of, you know, I wondered why, why we've got more women in the labor force and yet women continue to just be struggling. And then the other one, I wanted you just because I've got the chair's prerogative and I'm going to exercise the opportunity while I can is, the other thing that struck me is that, you know, with superannuation, there's actually quite a significant underspend in terms of people accessing and utilizing their superannuation. There's a fair chunk of it that gets, uh, I guess, uh, almost um, sequestered for, for um, as a kind of uh, inheritance for people to pass on to their children. So I wondered if you had any reflections on, on those two kind of phenomena. Well, let me take the second one first. Um... When surveys are undertaken of older people's preoccupations with what they want their money to do, requests don't figure that strongly. But you're right that there is a lot of underconsumption in retirement relative to um, the resources that individuals have. And I think I've thought a bit about this. I think I think I think the reason is that people are very uncertain. So when you're working, when you have a job and you're active in the labor market, 
you have a very natural hedge against unanticipated events. Something bad happens, your daughter gets divorced or whatever it might be, right? You can, you can adjust your labor market activity to try to accommodate that. More, many people can. But once you've drawn your last paycheck, right, all you have is your capital. And that makes you immediately much more nervous. So there, there, there is, people talk about aged care, but I don't think it's confined to aged care. I think that there's this amorphous sense that there's a whole slew of uninsurable risks out there, uh, and you could be confronted with any one of them, and all you have is your superannuation assets to cope. And so you're immediately cautious about spending them down. I experience this. <laughs> um, and, and so... I think that's that's what's going on. I don't think it's primarily about, oh, I've got to save my superannuation for my kids. I think bequests, you know, there is a bequest motive, particularly amongst wealthier people, but I I think it 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 more often takes the form of passing on the owner occupied home, something like that. It has a lot less to do with superannuation. I think the money that's left in superannuation accounts when people die. Either they die unexpectedly early or they have been cautious for the reason that I have outlined. And there's limited evidence on this, but what evidence there is puts the quests quite a long way down the list. I forget your first question now. It was about women and the, oh, the right. kind of growing income inequality in inventions. Well, income inequality. inequality generally is, I oh. think, getting worse. And I think that has a lot to do with unanticipated asset appreciation that has benefited the older generation, right? Uh, and it's benefited the older generation because they've been holding the assets at the time the assets went up. They disproportionately hold those assets just because of the stage they are at in their life cycle. And I think the important part of the inequality there, and it gets to the second part of your, your question, the important part of the inequality there is that the next generation will very disproportionately have passed on to them that accumulated wealth. So my concern would be that the next generation, if you looked at wealth inequality of the next generation, once people like me go and die, it's going to be much more unequal than it was when I was younger, because that asset appreciation has kind of been concentrated in a way that it hasn't been previously. I don't think that's going to happen every generation. I think this particular generation has enjoyed that increase in asset values. I don't think they're going to keep going up for the next generation in the same way that they did for my generation. Um, but I'd be more concerned about that, that projected intra-generational inequality that I think will occur unless we can come up with policies to correct that. We've got a comment from David in the chat, and he says, great presentation. Should we have a more balanced national longevity strategy, which encourages or incentivizes more people to remain productive for much longer and to share the bonus that increasing longevity is creating for them? And also, should we educate people to understand their own longevity much better so that they can address their options in an informed way? Yeah, so let's, yeah, well, I think the answer to both is yes. I, I've done some research on the Norwegian uh, system, which underwent a huge reform in 2010. And now, you know, enough time has gone past that you can see what the behavior of people has been like after the reform, you can actually get some sense of how people have responded. Um, and one of the changes, what they what they did was reduce, went against the trend. They, re, they reduced the access age, the standard pension to a whole group of people, but they reduced the, the annual benefit too. So it sort of went from 67 to 62, but the benefit, if you took it at 62, it was still actuarially fair, right? It was a, a lower amount. So you didn't get initial, any additional value, right? And what they found was that, that people would reduce their work, right? Because they could have the access at 62. So they reduced the amount they worked in each year, 
but actually they spread that work over more years into the future. So they took some took some pension and then they had their their work at a lower rate, but they worked for more years than they would otherwise have done. Then so that I thought was very interesting. And it it's a way in which you can encourage people to remain in the labor force and productive for longer. And it's exactly what we do with our superannuation guarantee. You can take it at 60, but there is no requirement that you stop work. Right? And so I think that that's consistent at least with the policies we currently have. And obviously education is education is very important and a better sense of people's own longevity can only help. I think many of us underestimate how long we're going to live. All right, we'll take the last question or comment uh, for this, um, which is related, I think, to the previous point about people staying in the workforce for longer. That's one side of the coin. The other, of course, is, as Bridget rightly points out, that we need to combat ageism and age stereotypes within this, because this limits workforce participation as well as social connection and community inclusion. Yeah, I agree with that totally. Uh, I think that older people have a great deal to contribute. I think that... Many employers underestimate the potential productivity of older workers and direct hiring towards younger cohorts when they need not do that. Um, we actually have a, a program within CPAR that's focused on how organizations can change attitudes to better accommodate older cohorts in the workforce. I think I think it's a, I agree, it's a, it's a loss if we don't do that. Okay, um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to have to close the, the Q&A session, but um, I think it's been a really interesting and dynamic session. And would you all please join me in thanking John with your clap reactions? <laughs> not quite not quite as uh, entertaining and, and enjoyable as a, as a real one, but, uh, but uh, I think nevertheless, we've all learned something very much from it. Uh, that brings our session for today to uh, a close. Next month, we're going to have Dr. Cherry Hugo presenting on the topic of the Lantern Alliance and food in aged care. And that will be on Tuesday, the 19th of March at 12 p.m. And with that, I uh, thank you all for joining us today and wish you a good afternoon. Thank you.